Welcome to Consider Yourself Hugged. I'm Tammy. I'm Michelle. I'm Gracie. And a hug is a gesture intended to convey a sense of care, support, safety, intimacy, and affection. And even though we can't wrap our arms around you, we want you to consider yourself. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> okay, well then we're on to you, Michelle Welly. <laughs> Why I called you Michelle and Lily. <laughs> it's completely fine. Completely Together fine. again. Together again. Yes. And so what I would like to talk about today is comfort. Oh. Yeah, the, the whole concept of, of comfort and um, kind of comforting ourselves, comforting one another. And I have a story to kind of start out with. But before I get started, anything else anybody wants to? No, but you saying that, well, I say no, and then I'm talking, but I feel like, you know, we've said the past couple of times we're nearing the end of the season. And since it's called consider yourself hugged, I think this, what it may, I mean, just that whole concept of comfort, um, probably will be, we'll probably do this last because that's what we're here for. Right. Basically. Well, and you showed at the beginning of yours, you showed cups for the first day of, of fall when we talked about yes and so I got brought my cup up here this is my favorite cup and it says today is my new favorite day and I was questioning a few minutes ago whether this is toxic positivity hopefully not <laughs> so we'll put a link to Gracie to our last session about toxic positivity, toxic positivity. so but I'm going to say no what do you say Gracie Oh, I think it's a celebration, not toxic at all. Yeah, okay. we're good. And like, it, it makes me, I mean, it really does. It can definitely like make me happy in the morning and like things like that. But the um, story I'm going to share relating to comfort is, um, I was telling Tammy about this a couple of days ago. So this week earlier, a couple of days ago, actually, it's kind of a blur. I don't even know how many days ago it was. I drove to East Tennessee because my sister was in the ER. And um, she had a terrible headache, worst headache she'd ever had. And she was at one ER and it was going on three hours and Mm. she hadn't been seen at all. And she's getting really, really upset. And my brother-in-law called me and he's like, I've I've never really seen her like this. I don't know what to do. So I said, okay. I didn't realize you weren't there at the very beginning. No. No, she was in a separate, she was in a different ER and I won't name names of ERs, but she was in a different ER. And I have a couple of friends that live in Knoxville. And one of my friends had already told me that the particular ER they were at was not good. She told me that in another situation. And um, so I I called that friend to kind of double check and make sure, you know, you, you did tell me that this is not the place to be right. That, and, and she's like, Oh yeah, of course. And she told me where they should go. And then she offered to drive there until I got there. Um, Cause she Aww. also worked at the medical field and it was concerning the symptoms she was having and how long it was taking. But unfortunately I think that's just the state of where we are right now. And um I haven't been to an emergency room in so long that I wouldn't have even thought of that. And people had told me that, but again, there are certain things where you, you kind of feel like, oh, that probably, it's probably dependent on situations. And, but, um, so then I drove to Knoxville. I know they got there to the ER, the new ER around seven 30. Um, it, she did not get, pulled back into the ER until I believe it was like 3 30 a.m yeah. so we sat there yeah eight hours yes oh. and and she did an hour too probably thankful I mean from what I understand my friend was very very vocal he was there before I got there and she got a CT scan at hour two but oh, they did good. not okay. yeah they didn't discuss the results until she got pulled back and so we're kind of sitting there when I got there, you're assuming that if it was something like if they thought it was a stroke or an aneurysm or something like that, that something very quickly would be done, but you don't know that for sure. Right. Right. Because there's no, no communicating going on really. 
and you can tell the, the staff are very frustrated, right? Because they don't want people to be waiting and people are coming up saying, you know, I've been here seven hours. How much longer yeah. am I going to wait? And um, so like we're all sitting here in the, the ER and kind of the scenario, like, you know, around 1 a.m., 2 a.m., you know, people who've been there since five and again, like several of them, because you're sitting there and you know why other people are there because they're talking. Yeah. And so a couple of them did seem like very critical things that needed definitely to be seen. And like around hour seven, it's like you could see one by one, you're sitting here talking and it, it felt very much like, and I'm going to make a joke because that's what my sister and I do. That's one of the, how we comfort, <laughs> each other. we comfort each other by telling jokes we always have even mm. when we were young. I didn't that know that. Siblings and I, it, it could be a really bad situation, but we're going to make a joke just to kind of provide some relief. And so it felt very much like, you know, one of those apocalyptic movies where something disastrous has happened and everyone is sitting where they are trying to decide if they're going to stay there or if they're going to venture out to the outside world. To it's see, the zombies? Yes, to see yeah. if they... And and so it it all felt like that. So one by one, these people with these very like serious medical things that need to be looked at, they would rip off their blood pressure cuff because again, everybody had a blood pressure cuff because instead of pulling people back to do like Q2, Q4 vitals, they came out and they took everybody's vitals in the waiting room. So anyway, but people, they would like rip off their blood pressure cuff and they'd be like, I just can't do this anymore. And they would leave. One person's blood pressure was like, you know, 222 over like 114. And this person had already had a stroke. Oh my before. gosh. That's very high because yeah. you're listening. Yes. You yes. And they're sitting, did they, they hadn't even been brought. They were, oh, holy schmoly. Okay. Well, and, and when I say they haven't, when you originally get there, they do take your blood pressure and then you go back out to the lobby. There was one case where an, probably a woman in her 80s was brought in on a stretcher and they just took her off the stretcher and put her in the waiting room (laughs) y'all I am not kidding I'm not wait at what what point did you get there I got there let's see I probably got there right around 10 there's a time difference I left here at around six which would have been seven so yeah I got there around 10 I didn't really stop I you were there for that. most of that whole she got there yeah, at like yeah. 7 30 or 8 or yes I did not and then I, I was there until um like 5 30 the next morning so all of that to say you know people get upset they're leaving and like so a couple of things from that like looking at when people are scared when people are worried you know and finding ways in in the sense of like best comfort in those scenarios and for us like I said it was we I told jokes but her head was so bad at times she was like oh please you know that was good but don't you know because laughing at times would make it it worse you know she was like I'm gonna miss my CPR training tomorrow I've already paid for it do you think if I fall out and they have to do CPR on me they'll just go ahead and recertify me (laughs) <laughs> and I was like no but I think if one of these other people fall out and you have to do CPR <laughs> on them maybe they'll recertify you I mean and so that's again kind of how we comfort each other can can you pause for a second and at least let you know those listening and watching your sister's okay yes yes okay. she is okay She's- I thought you know because we don't want to yeah, leave people point. wondering if she was but, so she she did they um did like a muscle relaxer and and she's still waiting she uh, a super positive is she got her mri moved up by three weeks so she'll have it this coming week and so hopefully she'll have some some answers okay. um but the night was pretty she was pretty sick i mean and but everyone there a lot of people let me say this a lot of people there were pretty sick and you can't obviously the, it's not the staff's fault it's nobody's fault. It's a system where there's a lot of people, limited supplies. Yeah. It's just, just tough. And so 
like the first thing I kind of want to start with was in terms of comfort, we're going to start there and then just kind of talk about comfort in general. When you're in situations like that, kind of very stressful situations, is there anything you have found that is helpful comfort wise, like humor, or having close people around you? What to you provides comfort? Hmm. Well, I think humor is definitely something like I remember Tim's when Tim and I first married, which was 2003, and then his biological mom passed away the next year. She didn't raise him and it was a very strange situation, but we went up to New York to her funeral and it was in a Catholic church and I was raised Catholic. Tim was not. And so she was, you know, not old. She died from, I think it was breast cancer or lung cancer. And so there we are in this Catholic church and he's not been to a Catholic service and there's the kneel, stand, sit, and you know, all the liturgical stuff. And when the priest is coming in, they're swinging incense. And then the priest, um, there's an episode of Seinfeld where the rabbi talks like this and is very sing songy in his voice. And the priest was that way. And we were laughing quietly laughing, making the Seinfeld comments. And it was quite, you know, I mean, it wouldn't have been appropriate. Like if I had been laughing and he wasn't, you know, there with his, <laughs> but it was, it did help, I think, comfort him in this situation where he had just discovered that, you know, it was, it was a tough time for him. So I think humor is definitely something we use too. I don't mean to just say the same thing you did and I'll think about it, We'll pass to Gracie for a minute and see what you've got. Okay. So yeah. So being able to see beyond the, whatever the crisis or the pain is, you know, so humor is huge. Um, you know, a big thing for me is asking me what I want. Cause mm -hmm. sometimes people will try to help. It's like, no, you're just, you're just making it worse. You're getting in my way. And sometimes I'd really like the help. And it's not because I'm wishy-washy. It's just, it's the situation and what I need in that moment. So to legitimately ask, you know, and I might not know the answer and that's fine, but asking me, that's a, yeah. that's a big deal because every situation is kind of different. You know, this yeah, might, good. yeah, this might sound weird, but I feel very safe and comforted when I am warm. And so things like blankets and um hot chocolate here. hot chocolate I mean truly that's part of the reason why I mean even just the act of holding this warm cup and I have a heating pad on my chair I think I've told y'all that before and so it's not necessarily like in crisis but just like being wrapped up being wrapped up being swaddled <laughs> being mm -hmm. warm is a great a great sense of comfort to me. It really is. And I think when, when I went, I stayed with a friend in a hotel when I was doing the teacher training in Houston in August, we shared a room and um, she has a thermostat in her body where she wants the air like on 60. And then I, oh, yeah. So they had these two amazing blankets. They brought me a second one in the hotel room. And every morning I would get up and we're about to go do this, you know, this, especially on the first day with all these teachers. And I would go out in this little dark and just wrap, wrap in these blankets. And it just was so soothing. So that's something that comes to mind. And, and you know, they, that is something they did have like heated blankets for people that needed them in the waiting room. And so mm -hmm. that was something that was really nice. I don't know if they just did that at night or if they had that during the day too, but I do, I mean, that was really, oh. Uh, comforting as well so and so with um comfort I can remember like like my favorite theory in school you got to study all these theories that you know a lot of them you never think ever use again but my favorite theory when I was in graduate school was this theory called comfort theory hmm. and it was this theory that basically anything whether in like situationally or healing wise because this was a nursing graduate school program can be enhanced with through comfort and then the the theory broke down the domains of different things in comfort and 
physical, psychospiritual, sociocultural, and environmental areas of comfort. And it's um, that particular theory. It was by Catherine Kolkaba, and she used across a lot of different disciplines now, not just in nursing. But even then, I think that the concept that comfort mm. can go a long way, even in situations where things are really difficult. And I bring that up because culturally, I also hear on the flip side of that, a lot of things that are like, well, comfort is the enemy of progress. Have you guys ever heard that? Oh, yes. Yes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So, like, if you're not know. getting out of your comfort zone, you're not right growing. Yeah. Yes. And what, or, they think, what they think they mean is stagnation. But, but I mean, I, I could see where they get the, the word comfort. But yeah, well, I've heard that. Yeah. And like with, um, it's used a lot in different, um, like physical training type things, whether mm -hmm. it be, um, like some of the different ones, like I, you know, used to belong to a CrossFit gym, which I loved. So I'm not saying anything negative about that, but at the same time, like when you're thinking about physical activity, like, okay, you can't be comfortable and have growth. Right. Yeah. But I think from the nursing standpoint, from the theory standpoint, comfort was more like a state of mind than a physical like mm -hmm. you can feel yeah. comfortable while you're also going through really negative things. Hmm. So what are some of the, cause I, I thought it was very interesting that the three of us are, you know, Jesus following Christian women and none of us brought that up <laughs> cause you just said, <laughs> you just said those psycho and spiritual and environmental mm -hmm. and what were the other two? Oh, uh, or one. Socio, it was socio-cultural. And physical, which I don't know which one. So it's physical, psycho-spiritual, socio-cultural, and environmental. Hmm. Like I'm trying to think of, because I mean, I've been in, we've all been in lots of crisis situations. And I guess I've never really thought through what exactly comforts me, except, you know, I know that warmth and just mm -hmm. being, you would have thought I did buy a weighted blanket, hated it really hated really? it oh. somebody told me that maybe I got one that was too heavy because it was like 25 pounds and mm -hmm. so that might have been it but it was very anxiety provoking because I could barely get out from under it underneath so, it yeah that makes sense yeah should yeah. I try again maybe with a lower weight maybe there's, I was when you said that I was surprised that it wasn't comforting to you so maybe there's a formula there's a formula for weighted blankets and I don't remember what it is but it's based on your body weight oh Okay. I thought it was just based on how much comfort you wanted. So I wanted, I wanted the heaviest. <laughs> I wanted the heaviest. It was probably crushing to you. It was crushing. Was like, yeah. oh my God, this is awful. <laughs> um, but I haven't really thought about like some of the other things about what I turn to for comfort. I mean, we can think about the bad things, you know, that some people turn to like self-medicating and. Mm -hmm. or the, or the negative things that maybe aren't so helpful. Um, what else do you turn to Michelle? So for me, I think that the same things you said, like, like warmth, you know, things that I find are really positive. I've talked before about like spaces, like beautiful spaces, like kind of mm -hmm. creating a space that feels comfortable to me mm -hmm. is, um, can be very comforting but also I think that um even in situations where things are stressful like mindset and you talked before I don't remember which podcast about like meditation mm. about like mindfulness meditation how it really can produce a state of internal comfort that lasts longer than just when you're practicing it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that's really helpful for me, exercise, not to the point where like, like the, the hardcore, you can never be comfortable while you're, you're exercising to have any growth, but like, because it affects my mood, 
Yes. Yes. Like positive exercise also can kind of produce more of that all day long Mm -hmm. feeling of, of comfort. So, well, and also food, I mean, food's sacred to human beings and the comfort food. I mean, which we have to make sure that it's it's not unhealthy, right. You know, because there's a difference between, oh, this tastes good and eating our feelings, you know? Yes. Um, But to be able to eat with somebody and have that connection and have that, because like I said, you know, food is part of who we are wired to be human community. Well, yeah, you watch any of the medical shows, you know, because you were just talking about that. But if you watch, I don't know, Grey's Anatomy or any of the things in there focusing on the patients, they always go eat, you know, let's go yeah. grab coffee or let's go grab food or let's go grab. And it's, you're right. I mean, it's the, mm-hmm. just that social part of it doesn't really matter you. what you're looking at. And I think it's just having someone there sometimes I mean like with the story that you told Tammy and the story I told about the ER I mean we didn't really even mention the fact that we were there right you were there for Tim I was there Mm -hmm. for my sister and that's the reason I went I went to be comforting knowing that I wasn't gonna be able to really do anything right like medical wise I think like showing up for people and understanding that you don't always have to say anything Mm -hmm. um one of the best texts I got was um from someone who's in the nursing program with me also interested in mental health when my mom passed away she passed away very suddenly and unexpectedly and she texted me and she said um please let me know if you'd like for me to come sit with you in therapeutic uncomfortable silence oh (laughs) oh my god that's lovely oh my gosh yeah oh my gosh that is amazing Yeah. And I I literally just like laughed out loud, but it was true. You know, it's like that sometimes just sitting there with someone and, and not requiring them to say anything, you not trying to say anything to fix it, just being present and asking kind of like what you guys have said of, you know, you can ask them, do you need anything? Mm -hmm. If they know, just being there, I think. Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, because like what you just said was about someone else who was sort of creating this offer of comfort for you. And when, when Tim and I moved to California, y'all remember, but my house was broken into in the middle of the night when I was by myself and car was stolen and everything. And, and my sister was like, do you want to stay here? And I said, no. And then night fell that next night. And I was like, I won't, I won't say a cuss word, but it was like, heck no, I am not staying here. So I went to her house and I can still remember the feeling right now. And maybe it's more safety, but it was still comfort too, that they, they gave me their bedroom. They had it all cleaned up and just these nice blankets. She had Reese's there for me, you know, the television remote and they just, I had my own bathroom and they just, they gave me. I knew that they were right outside the door and they just, it was the most peaceful, you know, just having them there. It wasn't just, it was the peace that, I mean, Barrett, you know, would, he's a bigger guy. And I mean, just knowing he was there and that I wasn't by myself and I had my dog with me and they gave me the room, but also the chocolate and, and also knowing that stay in the room if you want, come out. Yeah. They, they met me where I was. This is such yes. a nice topic. I'm it's having these happy feelings. Well, so here's my question too, is how much of our comfort is due to feeling of safety, whether it's a safe space where we can be ourselves with, you know, one of the things Michelle, you said was, well, you had the CT scan and we're assuming no news is bad news. Yeah. No, no, no sorry. Oh, no news is good news. Right. Right. You don't oh, right. Know, right. And that's part of the stress is that you, you know, you didn't know. So how much of our comfort is safety feeling safe yeah it could be physical safety emotional safety you know yeah safety is important so if i'm sitting with somebody they know if i just all of a sudden break into tears they'll be fine with it Mm -hmm. that feels so comforting i mean like if you look at the four things kind of we started like with the physical and environmental of course safety is huge in those you know like you said physical in terms of um, health or like someone right. harming you mm-hmm. and then 
like psycho spiritual and socio cultural. I do think a lot of issues within the past several years have come up from a socio cultural standpoint yeah. because people don't feel safe. Right. Right. Yeah. Physically and my emotionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Within society, even sometimes. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at a lot of the legislation and stuff that's being passed, a lot of people that don't feel safe existing where they live. Yeah. So that's something that we can do. I mean, we can create that intimacy. We can be good listeners. We can be present when people need us. I mean, that's, you know, healthy something relationships. We do change the world. Oh, yeah. Yes. Exactly. Well, what about psycho spiritual safety? Well, to me, spirituality is connecting to something greater. So, um, kind of like you were talking about earlier, Michelle, about being grateful about being in recovery. I'm, I'm not grateful that I experienced these things, but I am grateful where I am now and stuff like that. So maybe seeing not just, oh, you know, this will get better or whatever, but having an idea of there's a purpose, there's something we can do. I'm going to walk through this, connecting to something greater. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why prayer and meditation are mm -hmm. so powerful. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like from the standpoint of others, like being accepting, like what Tammy said, of people where they are mm -hmm. from that standpoint, I think sometimes people don't feel like they can go to certain, um, I don't know what they're ordering. I mean, we don't, it's, it's bigger than just churches and so forth, but like, I think mm -hmm. sometimes people don't feel like they can go because what they're struggling with doesn't fit yeah. that particular model. So being open mm -hmm. to letting people where they are. Yeah. Yeah. I think that too, when it comes to um, spirituality, of course, my reliance on God is important and knowing that he's in charge and no matter what happens that that I'll be okay in some realm, but also on the human level is being able to talk to my Christian friends that I go to church with to let the, for them to like that I'm on medication and to feel safe that I'm not going to be, you know, criticized for that. And so being able to have open conversations and not just have to say, you know, yes, I'm blessed and everything's great if it's really not. And so is, is that what you mean, Michelle? Sort of that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I think too, kind of when you said that, just the the concept that, yeah, we absolutely love the Lord and we know that his plan is best. That doesn't always mean that the emotion won't be there. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, we're going to feel afraid or anxious, you know, all those emotions from time to right. time. Like, like you kind of bring in again, like what I said before, like, you know, when my mom died suddenly, even though I had an understanding based on things she was going through, well, maybe long-term, like plan wise in terms of what she was spared, that may have been the best thing for her. It didn't keep me from grieving. Yeah. But we have an episode <laughs> that we did on grieving. Do you remember the green sweater? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm which we'll post a link to that just because I think it's, it, it's, it's pertinent to what we're talking about here. And it was really super special. Well, and so also something that you just said triggered my thought is a lot of times we need to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So just knowing that it's safe for us to be uncomfortable adds its own comfort in and of itself. That's so. interesting. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the other things in that self-esteem book, which we talked about a couple episodes ago, I think, um, talks about like that very thing really. And that let's say that I want to go back to school or which I'm not, by the way, um, <laughs> get a promotion or take, take a risk or whatever it is. And then your mind is like telling you, so there's this discomfort, right? And it might mm -hmm. be fear or uh, no, you know, I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. Um, I don't have the the right tools. So-and-so is better than me. And so then my mind says, well, let's just put the decision off for, for like three months. And then suddenly your anxiety goes down and you feel good. And so mm -hmm. we sometimes push those things off. So, and I, I get that. So it's feeling discomfort is, ugh. Yeah. 
feeling fear, feeling anxiety and worry. I don't like it at all. Mm -hmm. And primarily because, you know, having panic attacks was one of the worst things, the worst feelings of my life. And so Mm -hmm. when I start feeling fear or worry, then, you know, you're, then it's like, is it going to escalate to that? So I don't want it. So I don't, it's, that's one of the things I probably battle with is feeling okay with discomfort. Yeah. And until we address it, it's probably not going to just go away. So to have those people in our lives that can be good listeners, can give advice if we want it, can put a context into it. And yeah. And you know what I'm finding? I mean, I'm very, very lucky that I have people, but I'm finding so many people don't have that person that they can be uncomfortable with. You know, I think that goes back to what Michelle said earlier, and I didn't even realize it, that maybe we, me, whatever, make these assumptions or forget, let's put that way, forget that not everybody who's watching and listening has the same support system that we do or the same, you know, access to, to growing and learning that we do. You know, you might be, you might be watching or listening and be stuck and think, well, I don't have those supportive people or how do I do this learning and growing? And I hope that you'll stay with us and go back and listening to some of the other episodes and reach out for help, you know? Yeah. Like, Cause you need that person who's going to ask you is the discomfort of the moment. I mean, weigh that against the greater good later on. You need somebody to ask that hard question. Yeah. At time, so. mm-hmm. I'm not a good hard question asker, by the way. You can be, you've asked me yeah. some hard questions. Yeah. Have I? I'm so yes. sorry. <laughs> don't be sorry don't be sorry I needed you to ask hard questions okay well good yeah yeah good so I, I one like of the things I what friends do right yeah what yes. what'd you say I said I feel like that's what friends do like that yeah. close center yeah yeah true but I mean there's also friends who are you remember we talked about dress pants and I mean Right. Dress friends and pants friends, you know, dress friends are those people who are like, eat that other donut. It's fine. And pants friends are like, you really need to stop that. You know? So yeah. I I tell my team that I'm mean as a snake and they don't, they don't believe me, but I'm like, just ask a bunch of my ex clients. Oh yeah. They'll tell you. Cause I can ask those hard questions if need be. (laughs) Mean as a snake. And you know what? What? And I'm not, please, I'm not taking any credit for this at all. Um, a lot of those people that saw me mean as a snake are still sober five, 10, 15, 20 years later because they, they were in an environment that included me that allowed them to heal. We need that stuff. We need that discomfort. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. Well, is, so just so to summarize, so we talked about several ways that we can comfort ourselves, comfort one another, but also talked about the fact that discomfort can be a means of growth and not something to completely run away from. Yeah, I like that. It's just saying that um, just because we will feel uncomfortable when we grow doesn't mean we always have to feel uncomfortable or is that, I mean, I like that. Yeah, yeah. I like that. Well, thanks, Michelle. That was cool. Thank this you. Was really good. And I love, I mean, I don't know if this will be our final episode for the season, but I think it is kind of good because we called it consider yourself hugged because we know that a hug is something that makes someone feel comforted for, for, for most, not for everybody. Right. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, even if you don't want to be hugged by everybody, there's anyway. No, not everybody. I have a, a colleague that like she pretends to sneeze when someone tries to hug her. <laughs> oh, that is awesome. Oh, what? that is awesome. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Yeah. So not everybody, but a hug is a means for many yeah, people I like to, hugs. to feel yeah. comfort. Yes. I like hugs too. So thank everybody for being with us this whole time. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen going forward because we even said, what is a season? We don't know. It's just the time when we said, well, let's, because we, it's a lot to, to do all these things and so we need a little bit of time to regroup and figure out what we're doing next but keep listening keep watching we'll still keep sharing things um we just love you being here so much still be part of our private facebook group 
and we will be back soon. So until we're together next time, whenever that is, consider, consider yourself, yourself hugged. 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 Hmm.